Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, welcome to the London School of Economics for this online event. My name is Jonathan Hopkin. I'm a professor of comparative politics in the government department and the European Institute of the London School of Economics. Um, and I'm also the author of a newly published book called Anti-System Politics, the Crisis of Market Liberalism in Rich Democracies, just published by Oxford University Press. Um, and so it's a great pleasure to be here to welcome uh, a fantastic panel of speakers uh, to talk about uh, against the system, anger, belonging, and the crisis of liberalism, which is the theme of our discussion today. So um, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First up, we have Eric Lonergan, who is a macro hedge fund manager, an economist, an author. He is the co-author of the uh, new book, Angrynomics, written with Mark Blythe of Brown University. He's author of a previous book on money. Uh, he also blogs at philosophyofmoney.net. And he will be uh, uh, speaking first. He'll be followed by Martin Sanbu, who's the European economics commentator for the Financial Times, and also author of a newly published book uh, called The Economics of Belonging, a radical plan to win back the left behind and achieve prosperity for all. Um, and he's also the author of a previous book, Europe's Orphan, and I'm sure many of you have been following his writings in the Financial Times for some time, uh, for some time now. Then we'll have my uh, colleague in the Department of Government at LSE, uh, Professor Leah Ipi, who is a professor of political theory. Uh, she is the author of uh, um, a great deal of important work in political philosophy, political theory, and the study of political partisanship. She's written a book, Global Justice and Avant-Garde Political Agency with Oxford University Press, and more recently, The Meaning of Partisanship, also with Oxford uh, published uh, with, uh, co-authored with Jonathan White. Um, so very warm, Elsie, welcome uh, to all of you. Um, now I've mentioned that um, there are a number of uh, books out, out that uh, we're gonna be talking about in this discussion. Uh, details about these books and how to get hold of them uh, are in the chat and on the event listing, uh, including a link to our independent book provider who is Pages of Hackney. Um, so uh, Martin, Eric, and, and I all have books that you can get hold of through those links. Uh, Leah will be critiquing our work and also presenting our own take on uh, the challenges to um, political and economic uh, um, orthodoxy that we're seeing at the moment, drawing on our own extensive work on theories of justice and citizenship and the politics of partisanship. So I'm just going to introduce briefly uh, what uh, kinds of questions we're going to be uh, asking today. First of all, we're trying to figure out why it is that our world looks so different uh, now than it did uh, a few short years ago. So the political upheavals of the, uh, the last decade, and especially the sort of Anglo-American shock of 2016, but also similar political earthquakes that were perhaps less noticed in places like Greece, Spain, Italy, and many other European countries on a lesser scale, uh, showed that people had lost faith in what we could broadly call the system, the economic and political system, the dominant institutions that had uh, um, set the tone of politics and economics over the last three decades or so. Um, so in my book, I call this anti-system politics. Uh, Eric and Mark in their book descri describe it as an expression of anger at the disconnect between the real economy and the economics uh, practiced by elites, hence Angrynomics, which is a fantastic name. Um, and Martin uh, refers to these same questions uh, through the prism of uh, a crisis of belonging. So have we really understood why apparently stable democracies have been shaken by what appeared to be quite un unexpected levels of political challenge? Um, next, as well as understanding why we are where we are, we will also want to figure out uh, what we can do about it. Um, so um, my book talks a bit less about this. Uh, Martin uh, has a, um, and the second part, uh, second half of his book talks of radical plan to bring back inclusive prosperity. Uh, Eric uh, and Mark's book ha is full of ideas for, as they call it, resetting the hardware of capitalism. 
Um, in my work, and I think I can speak for Leia too in this, um, those of us working in the field of political science are interested in how it is that we can reconnect citizens to uh, political institutions. So that's kind of the second broad theme I think we're going to be looking at. And finally, um, all of our published work that, that we're going to be drawing on it was, was written before COVID came on the scene. Um, and so has the pandemic changed the way we, we see the world? Does the pandemic fit into the story or challenge it? Uh, does it change our recommendations for what needs to be done in any significant way? Or does it indeed perhaps make the case for some of these reforms even stronger? And I guess a final point we might draw on is uh, what is the political reaction to the pandemic and in particular sort of movements emerging out of, out of the crisis, uh, um, such as Black Lives Matter, obviously most prominently, how do these new movements fit into the picture that has been painted um, in these books where we're gonna talk about? So um, just a few uh, practicalities. Uh, we're gonna uh, first be hearing from Eric and then Martin and then Leah. We'll each speak for around 10 minutes. We will then open up to a more broader, flexible discussion, including questions from our audience. So if you want to submit a question, uh, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, the questions will be submitted to us and we will um, pass them on to the speakers and hope to generate an interesting discussion on that basis. So when you submit your questions, please let us know your name and affiliation. And of course, we're very keen in particular to hear from um, LSE students and alumni uh, and incoming students. So please let us know if that is the case. Um, finally, for those using Twitter, we have a hashtag for today's event, which is the catch-all hashtag LSE Political Systems. So if you want to tweet about what you're hearing, uh, that's the hashtag you should uh, use. The online event is being recorded and will be made available as a podcast. Um, usually that will take a week or so to come up. Okay, um, and at that point, um, I think uh, we are now ready to hand over to our first uh, speaker, who is Eric Lonigan. So uh, over to you, Eric. Thank you, Jonathan. And can I start by thanking the LSE and your good self for organizing this and for inviting me. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Um, be, I feel like I'm back at LSE because I did my master's in economics and philosophy at LSE. So I'm kind of virtually back at home. Um, and it's great to be with you all. So let me try and summarize what maybe some aspects of the book that I think are more interesting or maybe more novel, particularly to this audience. So, so Mark is uh, my co-author, Mark Blythe at Brown University is a uh, professor in political economy. My day job uh, involves macro, I'm an economist, macro investing. So we, we had a worldview that I guess we've been formulating probably over the best part of a decade about what was happening in political economy. Um, and we, we decided to, to try and write a book together that would be engaging. So we decided to do it as a set of conversations. So we literally got together and started recording our conversations and doing it as a Q&A. And then we ultimately ended up transcribing it. And initially it just started out as a straightforward thesis about political economy. And at a certain point, I can remember it very clearly, Mark said to me, should we say anything about anger? And it was a very intriguing moment because I suddenly thought, well, anger is prevalent. And if, if you're anything like me, i would never really given it a great deal of thought. So I'd sort of taken anger for granted. So I could, and I started thinking, why, why do we get angry? What function does it serve? Are there good types of anger? Are there bad types of anger? I didn't even have an articulate psychology. Uh, and so I thought, I said to him, let's go away and, and, and do some research because this is a really interesting question. We, we, we kind of, if we're honest about it, we know nothing about it. Um, we're not psychologists. So we, we went away and started to read a vast amount of literature over the subsequently, it really it took us about nine months to a year. And it was a very, very interesting journey. So the first part of, of anger was familiar to me, or at least some of the ideas behind it, which is the Aristotelian idea 
that anger is an appropriate ethical response to a sense of injustice. Um, and this really appealed to me because actually I'd studied uh, some moral and political philosophy at the LSC and some ideas that I found very engaging uh, are those of somebody like Habermas who, was to who, who gives a, a cognitive case for ethics, which is that when faced by ethical problems, we provide very coherent reasons. We don't have to agree, but there is a cognitive process. So ethics isn't something irrational and crazy. Um, and actually this started to give, me, give us one part of the faces of anger was coherent. This, this Aristotelian idea that it's somehow a reaction to injustice. And in fact, if you read the most contemporary moral philosophy on anger, which is a book by Martha Nussbaum, who some, many of you will be familiar with, effectively updates this, this Aristotelian idea. But let me make it live directly to today, because then you can sort of see how this typology started to help us to navigate. If I take the case of Black Lives Matter, there is a great uh, interview on CNN. Some of you I'm sure will have seen it with Cornell West, um, the professor, I think he's at, at Princeton. Anyway, one of the intellectuals sort of leaders of the civil rights movement. And he appeals to this Aristotelian idea. In other words, he says, what would it say about our society if we could witness this level of police brutality on our screens and there was no reaction? In other words, if people weren't on the street saying, this is unacceptable and it has to change. So this part of anger we describe as the anger of angels, which is moral outrage. And this is a very long intellectual history. The next thing we did on this journey, so this was kind of quite intriguing. This is a sort of cognitive, instructive uh, form of the emotion. Now, then what we did is we did a big data search using Watson Analytics, which searched through hundreds of thousands of news stories and sorted them by anger. And the second most frequent type of anger that came up on this search, which when you realize what it is, you kind of go, did you really need to do a big data search, uh, was angry sports fans. And this is kind of like fascinating on multiple levels. If you say that to anyone who's been to a football match, ever, certainly recently, they kind of go, yeah, thanks very much for that, it's kind of blindingly obvious. Um, but it's a very curious phenomenon. So why is it that men, and it's typically men, will pay increasingly large amounts of money because it's expensive to go to football matches in very inclement weather, usually in pretty awful parts of the country to watch a, you know, really quite a poor game of football in order to get angry? And this got me thinking an awful lot about the role that this form of anger, this is very, very different to that Aristotelian Cornell West sense of injustice. This is something very, very different. So I started to go to football matches and study the fans. Um, Jonathan knows that the football team I used to go and see, I won't mention any names, but the football wasn't exactly fantastically high quality, but the fans were really, really interesting. And one of the things I started to notice about the fans is they don't just um, attack the opposition. That's sort of predictable. What's quite interesting is they regulate their own and they regulate the loyalty and commitment of their own. So they'll attack their own players for a lack of commitment. They like their managers to express aggression and commitment. And I've even seen fights within a, 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 the same group of fans over loyalty. So one of the fans claiming greater loyalty than another. And this is really, really interesting because I started to think that we, we could then link this with an idea from social psychology, which is there were a lot of studies that were done in the 1960s about how people form groups and our propensity to form groups, which has actually been confirmed now in neuroscience. And in, in, in social psychology, there's a thing called the minimal groups paradigm, which is the idea that you can get a classroom of children and literally make an arbitrary distinction. So you say, who likes this painter and who likes this painter and divide the class into two. And on the basis of that distinction, you will get them discriminating against each other and actually uh, instructing considerable harm against each other. So human beings are clearly are very, very hardwired to form groups on effectively arbitrary distinctions. And then anger seems to play a role in this, usually I think as a precursor to violence. And this got me thinking as well, is that we're familiar in ethics as economists with the problems of game theory and free riding. 
which is that if people are self-interested, they should always free ride versus other people behaving ethically. And this is a kind of problem for economics. And anger, in a sense, a loss of temper, the suspension of rationality is a kind of, you can sort of see how it solves that problem. But I've never thought of going to war as a collective action problem. But if you reflect on it, you should always send somebody else to the front line. Right? <laughs> so you don't want to be the first soldier or the first wave of soldiers. And I started to think that actually these angry fans are kind of tribal regulators. And the function that they probably serve is one way to solve a problem of scarcity is you break into groups and then you fight, fight over the scarce resources. Now, so we started out with this typology. So we have this anger of angels, the, the response to injustice, this anger of devils, which is this tribal energy. But the other thing we found very interesting, and again, you don't find this in the literature, is there appears to be a very clear distinction between public and private anger. So let me give you an example. If you had a colleague who suddenly started to display anger in meetings or with other colleagues, you're more likely to take them to one side and say, is everything okay, right? Is something, are you on, is, is, is something on wrong at home? Uh, you don't seem to be yourself, right? That is not the approach you would take to an Extinction Rebellion protester, right? If you, if you stop an Extinction Rebellion protester and say, why are you angry? They're gonna, get, they're gonna say, you should be angry too and they will provide you with coherent reasons and that we can preempt. They're gonna say, we're, we're destroying our air, we're destroying our land, we're polluting our streams, future generations. They will give you a coherent set of effectively interest-based ethical arguments, but that's not what we experience in our private lives. When, when, when we display anger, it is typically, not universally, but it's typically telling us about something internal, that there is a stress or a pressure. Now, if you take this typology that you have public versus private anger and these two faces of public anger, suddenly you have a lens through which to make sense of political economy because there's both a macro manifestation, which is either injustice, a sense of a requirement that things are no longer acceptable. You have a tribal energy and then you have kind of microeconomic stress. And so we, we thought this was then becoming a very helpful lens, both to enlighten us. I mean, frankly, I perceive things differently with this vocabulary of anger. I, I genuinely categorize my observations about political phenomena differently, but it also was able to make sense. Now, I, I, I want, I'll wrap up here because I don't want to take, I've, I've probably already exceeded my time, but let me map this onto a, a very clear political strategy. If you take the, the US presidential election, and this is as a broad generalization is true of a great many elections. Although we have majoritarian voting, many of these elections are being swung by minorities, right? So Trump actually wins the presidential election by changing the voting pattern of 80,000 people. Now we know from political science that angry people are more likely to vote. If you watch, Trump has a native intelligence about how to tap into these angers. So he will go to the Rust Belt and frankly make an ethical argument. I mean, he will say, I am your voice. Like, well, voice is an essential part of moral discourse. So he is saying, you haven't been represented. He will talk about the fact that there's been industrial decline, there's been wage stagnation. He will present it, of course, in terms of the scarce, in terms of a zero sum conflict, but he will effectively appeal to people's sense of injustice. He will then effortlessly go to a constituency where there is concern over if there is ethnic tension and he will start talking about a wall. He will start talking about marauding Mexicans. And so he will tap into this tribal rage. So it suddenly then becomes a political strategy. And I think one of the most articulate uh, spokesman of this is in fact Viktor Orban in Hungary because and, and this is the other I guess thesis in the book is that tribalism fills the vacuum that came from a loss of political identity under neoliberalism so so that the pre-neoliberal era there was a clear set of competing economic ideologies political ideologies political identities we lost our political identity but you still need electoral strategies and, and, a, and a coalescence of the incentive structures of the media and the political class is now exploiting this latent emotion effectively to win elections. And where we conclude the book is ultimately with an, with an optimism 
which is to say this is a failure of ideas. We need to tap into people's sense of moral outrage because a lot of it is legitimate. There is legitimate ethical fury about the environment, about inequality, and about the costs that are imposed on human beings, particularly the most vulnerable in our society from recession. The reality is I don't believe in centrism as an end in itself. Who wants a center if the center cannot tell me how they're gonna deal with the environmental challenge, how they're going to mitigate the costs of recession, how they're gonna tackle inequality. And I don't want complexity or fanciful ideas, I want clear, effective policies that will genuinely address these issues. And for me, that's the challenge of politics is it is ultimately about sets of ideas, which hopefully we'll hear more from, from Martin, that can become a case for providing us with an eth ethical motivation and a real sense of motivating identity, which is the only way to combat tribalism. Fantastic, thank you very much, Eric. Um... So that's a great start. And uh, from anger, I guess, to another way of framing the, the same problem, but from a slightly different angle, um, Martin's book is all about many, how many people, presumably many of the same people who in Eric and Mark's work are angry, uh, feel they don't belong or they're not allowed to be part of um, the, the contemporary uh, capitalist economy and pol contemporary political system uh, by extension. So. Um, let's hear it from uh, from Martin. Over to you. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to you, Jonathan, and to the LSE for for having me, and thanks to Eric for for going first because it allows me to to build on that. Uh, I learned a lot from Eric and, and Mark's book, and uh, I also find this concept of of anger and the observation of anger very useful. Uh, and in a sense, the books fit together because my main argument uh, or my main premise, I should say, is that. The people who have turned their back on the sort of post-war Western model uh, of liberal market economic uh, uh, political democracy, uh, they are angry uh, and they're angry for a reason. There is legitimate anger. Uh, and I think that anger is, is rooted or that reason is ultimately economic. This is sort of my premise. Uh, and indeed, I call it belonging. The book is called The Economics of Belonging. So, so I want to start by just saying briefly what I mean by economic belonging, uh, by where you can tie the two approaches together by, by thinking of uh, when Eric talks about anger, what I think people are angry about is the, this end of economic belonging. Uh, and to explain the concept of economic belonging, I'd like to take you back to, to that period that actually many of these anti-system angry parties angry men, they tend to be leaders, um, hark back to the sort of post-war couple of decades after the Second World War, uh, which has a slightly mythical status. This is what parties talk about or movements talk about when they want to make their country great again or take back something or take back control. It kind of harks back to some golden era. That's not, uh, you know, that there, there were always problems uh, at all points, but there's something that was true in the post-war three decades in every Western country, every country in what we used to call the industrialized world, which was that the economy was bringing everyone closer together. Inequality fell, not just income inequality, but wealth inequality, inequality between regions of the same country. So poorer regions were catching up with the capital cities and other rich cities. Uh, you had a process of convergence so that everyone pretty much you know, with some exceptions, uh, people were still excluded, but at least, you know, you didn't need to have uh, a degree, for example, high education to know that there was a place for you in this economy. And it was a pretty good place. You could aspire to that. That ended around 1980. Along all these dimensions, uh, you can look in pretty much every Western country and you'll see that inequality stopped falling and started increasing in terms of incomes, in terms of wages, in terms of wealth and also in terms of regional disparity, that convergence between poorer and richer parts of, of countries stagnated and in some cases reversed from around 1980. Uh, and that is what I call the end of belonging. And the people at the sharp end of this new process of divergence, economic divergence within countries, uh, they, I think, are, are completely justified in being angry. They no longer belong to the national economy. Uh, and we know that with economic differences, you get lifestyle differences, you get differences in opportunity, you get differences in 
in culture and even value sets. You live different lives, you live separate lives. And that in turn, I argue, drives a lot of the political toxicity we are experiencing today. Now, um, another big part of, of the view I set out in the book is that this economic change was not due to globalization. And this is where the angry parties, to call them that, get it wrong. They blame outsiders, they blame foreigners, they blame trade, they blame the global system. Uh, and if you're angry at that, you got the wrong target, I, I argue. Um, and I say that for, for a number of reasons, uh, but just to go very quickly through some ways the globalization, anti-globalization story doesn't hold up. The end of belonging happened well before globalization took off in earnest, sort of late 70s, around 1980. Globalization in terms of trading with poorer countries, in terms of big capital flows across borders, in terms of low-skilled immigration, really only took off in the mid-1990s. So the timing doesn't fit. The, the countries, the geography doesn't fit. The countries that have navigated the end of belonging best, uh, such as the, the European Nordics, have always been some of the most open countries in the world. They're very globalized, and yet they've tackled this better than others. They've had problems too. Whereas one of the countries that have tackled it the worst, the United States, is a very closed economy. It's not a very globalized economy, even though what you hear about is jobs supposedly being shipped to China. Um, if it wasn't globalization, what was it? In a word, it was technology, technological change, technological progress, really. There's, a, uh, th there's one fact I like to remind people uh, or tell people if they don't know it, which is that in pretty much every Western country, the number of factory jobs peaked in the late 1970s. But the amount of factory production, the output, the amount of stuff made in a country did not peak in the 70s. It kept growing and growing and growing well into the 2000s, stagnated a bit then. But in many G7 countries and many of the smaller rich countries, they're producing as much physical stuff as they ever did. So it's just not true that manufacturing went away. What is true is that manufacturing jobs disappeared. But increasing output with fewer hands is the definition of increased labor productivity. You just don't need as many people to produce stuff anymore. Uh, and so this would have happened with or without globalization. It's in the nature of getting better at producing things. So those jobs that tended to be pretty good at spreading the wealth, they disappeared. They're not going to come back, no matter how many walls you put up. Manufacturing is a particularly salient example, but this is true in other fields too. Some cute computerization got rid of a lot of clerical jobs. The internet is a big threat to retail. Artificial intelligence may well lead to automated driving and get rid of lorry driving jobs. This just keeps happening. But whenever it's happened, it's tended to hurt the same group of people every time. So it tended to be people with lower education, often men, not always, but at least in factory jobs and uh, you know, rig, rough, rig roughnecks or dock hands. These are typically male jobs. It's often jobs in rural or smaller towns, that sort of area. And it's, it's, it hits people who are less willing to move and adapt and embrace change by, let's say, moving to the big city. So it happens to hit several times the same kind, uh, the same group, the same demographic. And, and this will continue because that's in the nature of technology. So we'd better get it right. Uh, that's as far as I go in terms of diagnosis. And hopefully we'll get into discussion about some of this because I've, I've skirted over a lot of things. But what do you do about it? Uh, well, I think the answer has to focus on one central principle. Inequality has increased, but see, the answer isn't, or it's, it isn't only redistribution. This was the mistake, I think, of the centrist movements, you know, the, the third way they went by that sort of, of uh, moniker in the 1990s. You know, let inequality, let, let the market do what it wants, and then you redistribute from the successful to the unsuccessful. You have to do some of that. But it's not very sustainable economically if you have to really increase tax, tax rates to redistribute a lot or politically uh, because in the end people don't want to just be at the receiving end of redistribution what they want and what we should all want is for everyone to actually be able to engage productively uh, in the marketplace so what you want is to spread productivity and the big failure has been that in many countries we've allowed these this inequality of productivity to emerge. 
So some people, perhaps especially in, in the Anglo-American types of countries, the US and the UK, a lot of people work in very low wage but low productivity jobs, but you also see it outside of the protected sphere in countries with dual labor markets, France, Spain, Italy. Um, that's the challenge. You need to try to increase, you know, make more jobs more productive so that they can also pay higher wages so you don't have to do as much redistribution. And I mentioned the Nordics before. The Nordics are successful in a, in a social way, not because they redistribute a lot more than other countries, but because their market distribution is more egalitarian. They don't have to redistribute as much. Um, and this is often missed. So the kind of what we want to, to arrive at is a program, an economic program that allows as many people as possible to play a productive, in a very literal sense, a productive role in the economy. And that's what I think of as restoring an economy of belonging. Uh, I won't have time to go through uh, the various prescriptions I make, but I set out a, a program across a, a long list of policy areas but common to them all is that you want to embrace those who actually do go along with technological progress. So one set of proposals have to do with actually forcing companies to choose productive technologies, to choose to install machinery and so on, to choose to train their workers by lifting the wages at the low end. You can do that through minimum wage policy, by making workplaces more secure for workers, by basically making it unprofitable to rely on business models that need a lot of very low productivity labor, cheap labor. And this is what the Nordics have done over the last almost a century. You just compete out of existence, very labor intensive, low productivity labor intensive jobs. Uh, in addition to that, you need policies to uh, not just get rid of bad jobs, but to make sure better jobs are created. Uh, so you, of course, need a lot of investment in, in skills and education, but you need to allow people to move from poor jobs to better jobs. Uh, and it's a little known fact that across Europe, the countries with the biggest churn in the labor market, the biggest, the highest rate of job to job moves are Denmark and Sweden. People move jobs there much more often than in the rest of Europe. And that is part of how you can increase the productivity of all you need a very strong and aggressive macroeconomic policy to have a demand pressure in place so that those companies and sectors that do have high productivity jobs are encouraged to expand. So you need all of these things at the same time. You need a tax policy that shifts taxation away from labor somewhat onto capital, which is the opposite of what we've done over four decades where actually incomes have shifted the other way, away from labor towards capital or towards the managers of capital, the people at the high end of the wage distribution. Um, I, I won't go into more details here, but you, you can see the common theme. It is to try to encourage using market incentives that are created through smart policy interventions uh, that try to create the jobs that use human talent, human effort, human labor in the most productive way, rather than in the sort of disposable way at low wages with low productivity that you see in so many cases, and that you particularly see in the left behind parts of countries, and that lead to not just low wages, but unpredictable work, unpredictable incomes, uh, powerlessness at work, vulnerability to exploitation, and all these things that go together and against which people legitimately feel anger. So, so this is, you know, it's a sort of quick glimpse at what I think is, is the recipe. Uh, I'll just finish with a little anecdote to illustrate this. Um, I often tell this story of, of one particular economic activity that I think illustrates this very well. Uh, so I grew up in Norway and in the 1980s in Norway, if you wanted to have your car washed, you would either do it yourself or you would go to a, a car wash that used a, a big machine and the big blue rolling brushes. Um, I moved to the, to the States in the late 1990s uh, and I realized that there you would go to a car wash and more often than not, you would have three or four men always, often immigrant men, clearly with not much formal education, maybe not speaking the language, 
come down on your car with washcloths and do the job manually. I mean, these are just illustrations of something that in one system is done by machines. Much, many fewer people are employed in this sort of work. And I've checked this in the statistics, it's true, but they are paid better. And a system that uses human labor in a really inefficient way. These are not the sorts of jobs people should be performing. And, and there, are, you know, once you start thinking about that, there are other examples. In the US, they hire people to, you know, to pack your bags in the supermarket. That does not happen in Scandinavia. These are changeable things. The automatic car wash was invented in the US in the mid 20th century. Um, whereas in Norway, when I go back now, the hand wash has re-emerged, often courtesy of low paid immigrants who have arrived in the last 10, 20 years. So these things change over time. They are amenable to policy manipulation, to policy action. Um, and it's really up to us to first start realizing that and then get down to fashioning a program that does that. A program like that has to be pretty radical, kind of big changes across a lot of areas, but it's still centrist. Eric said he doesn't like centrism. I quite like centrism, but I think it has to be a radical centrism. And especially now that we're in a pandemic, we've suddenly seen that governments can be radical, including centrist governments. Uh, and I think basically our choice is not whether or not to have radicalism, but what sort of radicalism we get. And I'd much prefer a centrist radicalism than the sort of extremist radicalism that in practice is on offer from the very angry parties. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And I think that's that's a perfect uh, way to uh, uh, move over to Leia because I'm, I'm expecting Leia probably isn't too enthusiastic about the notion of radical centrism as such. I don't want to put words into your mouth, but um, I think what we've heard from Eric and Martin, there's a, there's a fair amount of agreement, I think, about the causes of the crisis, especially the economic causes of the crisis and some of the solutions. Um, and yet at the moment, uh, politics seems to be producing tarmacking over Kent so we can fill in more paperwork in our trucks going to Europe or, you know, in the craziness in the response to the pandemic in the US. So how do we get politics to, you know, orientate governments towards doing the right things, Leia? Great. Um, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for the books and for letting me engage with them. Um, I don't know if I'm the only one in this panel who sees anti-system politics not as a kind of inconvenience from which we need to be liberated, but as a movement, parts of which may have the potential to become opportunities for democratic renewal. So that's what I would, I guess, like to find out by the end of my comments and questions. What I want to do in the next few minutes is to highlight some points of convergence between all of us and then move on to sketch some areas of disagreement, uh, not so much with the policies that are proposed in these books, but with the conclusions on what kind of politics we need to implement these policies. And what really frames my remarks and has actually framed my research in the last few years is a question that I think is also at the center of Jonathan's book, which is the question of compatibility of capitalism with democracy about which I have become increasingly skeptical. So I will start with two points that may be useful to frame the discussion and I think are shared by all three of us, uh, certainly Martin and Eric in their books, but I think also Jonathan in his book on anti-system politics. So the first point on which I think there is convergence is the diagnosis. The idea that the anti-system backlash that we have witnessed in the aftermath of 2008 financial crisis has been the result not of cultural or identity conflict, but of distributive conflicts. And I think the thesis, which is very forcefully advanced in Jonathan's book, but which I think is also shared by the others, is that as a result of partly ideological and partly material shifts in advanced liberal democracies, the consolidation of neoliberalism in the 80s and 90s has produced a kind of divorce between what we might call politics on the one hand and economics on the other. So between the site in which democratic decision-making happens and the site of economic resource allocation. And that has meant that the power of states to control markets via competitive electoral mechanisms was also progressively eroded and political elites found themselves dependent on decisions that were taken elsewhere and which had also detrimental distributive effects over the most vulnerable citizens of these advanced liberal democracies. I think we all agree on this. 
diagnosis. And the, the backlash, the anger, is that since the interests of citizens were no longer served by these existing liberal parties in the existing liberal party system, and since citizens felt increasingly angry and excluded from democratic decision making and uh, with the decline in welfare standards and so on, rise of inequality, they channeled their anger in the anti-system forces that Jonathan describes in his book and with whose destructive effects we are still currently grappling in our public life. So, that's the diagnosis, and I agree with that diagnosis. The second point on which I think there is also convergence is a more constructive point, and I also agree with that. And that is the idea that returning to the status quo ante requires reasserting political authority over markets. Now, in Jonathan's account, this entails returning, either he says returning to the golden age of social democracy as some form of compromise between cap capital and labor, or to the nationalism of the interwar period, even if it's a uh, progressive nationalism. I think Eric and Martin are more clear on the fact that returning to the status quo ante would be undesirable because globalization, and I agree with this as well, is inherently neither good nor bad. It depends on what you do with it. So their proposals are for a set of policies which try to regulate markets and that promote fairness by remedying power imbalances in society. So this is where I agree. Now, I have some questions about both the diagnosis and the suggested solutions and where I have my quibbles with how um, we describe the situation and where the relationship between the policies proposed and the politics are from. So on the diagnostic part, I think my main source of skepticism is on what I think is a kind of romanticization of the idea that there ever was an age of economic belonging, to use Martin's term. That is to say, an age in which liberal democracy, competitive free elections, harmonically combined with a social market economy, so kind of capitalism that works for everyone, and that is also open to lowering borders and to realizing equal benefits globally. So I am skeptical that there has ever been a point in the history of liberal democracy in which these benefits have delivered for everyone in this way. And so that makes me wonder if the challenge is really to restore the economics of belonging, as Martin just put it, or to create it from scratch. And I just want to give one example, which goes back to the case, uh, again, one of the cases with very interesting with which Martin starts his book, but which also inspires the label of the Green New Deal, the New Deal, the idea of Roosevelt, Roosevelt's measures, the responses that were taken at a point of crisis as an example of a crisis which was turned into an opportunity. And why am I skeptical that even the New Deal, even these most progressive stages of liberalism or of the history of liberal democracy were actually very exclusive? Well, because I think for all of the benefits that the New Deal, say, brought to the United States, we must not forget that this was still the United States before the civil rights movement. And this was still the United States in which Jim Crow laws in the South were in still full force and where Roosevelt was reluctant to put anti-lynching legislation at the top of his electoral campaign and at the top of his political agenda for fear of losing votes from democratic whites in the south of the United States. So, uh, I mean, this is no criticism on Roosevelt because federal because lynching is still not a federal crime in the United States. So it's not as if there's been so much progress since Roosevelt, there has been some obviously. But the reason I mentioned this is that when we talk about the benefits of the New Deal, we are really talking mostly about white Americans. And if we turn to an assessment of the Roosevelt era for all its improvements, which I don't want to deny, the record in delivering federal help connected to the American South is much more mixed and that's being charitable. And I think something perhaps not as dramatic, but something along those lines could be said, Jonathan, for gender inequalities in the golden age of social democracy in Europe. So when we talk about the integration of women in public life, again, I think that record there is much more mixed. And I don't say this to reduce the achievements of which I'm very aware of either the New Deal or of the glorious years of social democracy, which I think all of us miss. I just don't want us to forget that when we focus on the crisis of liberalism as an economic crisis, we are taking, I think, a very narrow view. And I think we would come to a very different diagnosis on the system as a whole if we were to take a wider historical perspective which reflects on the legacy of the coexistence of liberal democracy with imperialism abroad on the one hand, 
and with racial and gendered segregation domestically, which are the conditions on which current anti-system movements find fertile ground and enter the mainstream and make them ripe. So the reason I mentioned this historical legacy is to think about what is the what does that historical legacy tell us about the current crisis of liberal democracy and why these anti-system movements that thrive on racism, thrive on sexism, thrive on xenophobia, why do they find the, tra the traditions, where do they find the resources in this tradition? I think because there is a problematic coexistence and legacy of coexistence and because this romanticized idea of belonging that we have, I think is really that is a romantic ideal and not something that matches up to the reality of liberal democracy, even in its most progressive stages. So let me now turn to some of the prescriptions for how to emerge from the crisis, which try to correct the power imbalances in uh, labor and capital, which Martin also identified in his talk just now. So macroeconomic policy, financial system that works for everyone, tax system, also some of the proposals that Eric gives in his book of a national wealth fund, which are all premised on the ideas that we have now, uh, as Eric says, high employment, no inflation, negative re real interest rates, and so on. First, I have a general question uh, for both of you, for all of you, actually, which is what proportion of your proposals would you still uphold given the current crisis? In other words, I have a sense that some of the premises, in particular, Eric, your assumption of continued high employment in advanced liberal democracies have been challenged quite significantly by the current crisis, given the rate of uh, ongoing rate of unemployment. On the other hand, I get the impression that there has been a significant shift in ideological outlook. So if you think about Rishi Sunak's budget in the United Kingdom, it seems to indicate a very significant degree of willingness to shake up the magic money tree that the conservatives said never existed. And so there may be much more mainstream consensus on what might have sounded very radical a few months ago. So I'd like to, you to, to talk maybe a little bit to the relevance of these proposals in the current crisis. Um, the second question I have is uh, that much of your analysis, I think, hinges on the relationship between kind of consolidating bargaining power for labor and increased productivity of capital and on the relationship between the two. And I think I detect in these progressive proposals a kind of optimism about the extent to which these two can be compatible. So uh, the idea that what we used to have and we lost was a wage setting system which would compensate for power asymmetries in the market and that would work for the benefit of the most vulnerable. So there's no reason you all say to think of this relationship as a kind of zero sum game since a wage setting system and possibly even stronger unions, more rights for workers can both improve competitivity and raise productivity. But if that is the case, if, we, if these things are compatible, I wondered when I read the books, well, why did we ever get neoliberalism? Um, presumably because what the rich were making under such a system of enhanced labor bargaining power was from their point of view, not enough, not what they could be making if they had a deregulated market. And it turns out they were right. They did make much more under an alternative regime. And Eric also suggests in his book that deregulation also delivered some economic gains. So this may be where there's some disagreement between you on which I'd like to hear more, but be that as it may, everyone agrees that inequality has gone up. So if I were a neoliberal and willing to play the devil's advocate, I would say, well, so what? It only matters if you think that the system should correct inequalities. It doesn't matter if inequality is considered a price that you have to pay for the sake of promoting a competitive system, which also maintains high productivity. And so it seems to me that here, there's difference is something that Jonathan raises in his book. There are different material interests and some of them are very well served by neoliberalism. So I want to know what is the incentive for changing them for these ac actors whose interests are promoted by the status quo. And I would argue that there is, it's very difficult to, to make an argument, a moral argument that would appeal to the neoliberals purely on moral grounds. And I think Jonathan would probably agree on this, that this is all down to power relations between different social classes. And insofar as moral arguments can be invoked, they can be invoked only if there are political movements that are ready to fight for these uh, moral ideas. And this, I think, harks back to a kind of vision of politics, which I am not sure is compatible with the liberal vision or with the centrist vision. 
since it seems to me that responsible liberalism is all about the promise of a system that can deliver for everyone and which denies the existence of fundamental differences of interest among different social classes. And so in this system, the resilience of policy ideas is measured by how well they can survive the electoral cycles, not by whether they can trigger radical change. So I think all of this is to say that the conflict between pro and anti austerity forces, which I think is a genuine conflict, is a conflict of material interests to begin with, but which then gets rationalized as a conflict of values, which turns into a political conflict between different social groups. And I think there is a genuine tension between those parts of liberalism that encourage competitiveness and promote the accumulation of profit, which is in turn required to make more investments. So the kind of capitalist part of liberalism and a part of it that requires liberalism to take social responsibility for the worse off and for the people with less power in the system, which is to say the democratic part of liberalism. And I think these two parts, the capitalist part of liberalism and the democratic part of liberalism pull against each other. And I don't really see a good way of sort of overcoming this. This is why I'm skeptical that liberalism can both promote the ethos of capitalism, which is you have to have certain power asymmetries between workers and employers so that the system can reproduce itself. And the ethos of democracy, on the other hand, which is inherently egalitarian and requires them to have equal political agency. So I would like to hear more about how compatible the ideas that you have about turning debt into equities, for example, or about a sovereign wealth fund or about taxing wealth are with the preservation of the capitalist ethos. To me, they sound like fundamental challenges of the system. It seems to me that a capitalist system is premised on competition, is premised on the idea that if you work hard, you make the right investments, you are rewarded. And if you fail, you have to take responsibility for your failures. And in this system, what you have now is the result of what you deserve. And those who try to deprive you of what you have deserved in the form of cancelled debts, for example, or taxing your wealth are effectively promoting a form of stealth on your wealth. This is what the neoliberal believes. This is a fundamentally different set of values. And so they make your efforts worthless. So there comes a point in which a great policy idea, which asks us to commit to a different radical set of values, hits hard against political reality and against the political interests that are promoted by those groups that are wedded to the existing interests. And also against the kind of ideological constraints that uh, push people to frame this reality. So if the conflicts of the last few years are anything to go by, it seems to me that ideological conflicts matter as much in the current climate as the policy ideas that are required to overcome these distributive conflicts that we face. But I didn't get a sense from either of your books on the plan for how we can move from where we are, so a world which is populated by Trump supporters and people who are reluctant to wear masks, to a world where we want to be, where we have all these radical policies which we think presumably can be endorsed by everyone. So how can these ideas be delivered without a fundamental critique of the system? And this raises, uh, this leads me to the last point and which I raised because I think when Eric and Martin come to the political question of how one realizes these ideas, they both conclude with a kind of longing for centrism, which is understood as the optimal political movement which enables convergence on sensible policies that are both sensible morally and solid across electoral cycles. But I want to know what is the relationship between this idealized form of centrism, radical centrism, and the centrism that we have now, the current politically centrist movements. So current centrist movements are the intellectual descendants of the third way. And as Martin points out in his book, they have been ideologically captured by the pro-austerity neoliberal narratives, desert focused theories of justice that have justified the benefits of the winners of globalization. So how are you going to navigate the conflict between your idealized centering and the real world centrism that we have inherited from the third way? The second question, which I think is possibly even more important has to do with structural constraints on how you realize this, because it seems to me that many of the measures, the policy measures that we propose can only work if we have a level playing field, globally speaking. And how is this compatible with huge asymmetries of wealth and power that the current global order entrenches? 
And is it possible to reconcile the coordination of national government measures and transnational institutions that promoting these policies would require with the fact that our political system is only accountable at the nation state level, with the fact that democratic decision making is the site of democratic decision making is still the nation state and where we assess democratic performance through national electorates. So how can we continue to deliver change that continues to remain democratically accountable without reproducing the current divide that we experience between a site where technocratic sound policy decisions are made and taken and those where political responsibilities by national electorates are faced. And this is really the final point I want to make, which is a general point about the relationship between agency, voice and trust. So if we accept with Eric that people are angry and that they are angry with the intellectual and policy making elites whom they see as responsible for the failures of the last few years, then I think it's not enough to have the policy that will empower people again, because what is required is also to restore trust in their agency as a kind of political agency. It's required, what is required is to convince them that they have a real political voice but I would say that the policy-based perspective is very much of a kind of recipient-oriented perspective. It's about giving people stuff to make sure that people have enough that they can contribute by consuming, they can boost demand, and so on. And that is not, to me, doesn't seem to be the same as democratizing political life. In other words, fixing the economy is a different task altogether from the task of democratizing the public sphere as a whole, not just at the national level, but also at reg regional levels and at transnational uh, levels. So if people have lost trust in democracy as the reality in which we live, how can you restore that trust? And how can you restore the trust as a kind of project, which is a project that has failed in the past, but that you say, well, it has the potential to still renew itself. To me, it seems much more sound much more realistic to say look democracy was never there but we're going to create it now and so instead of saying democracy is the reality in which we used to be and we need to return we need to say democracy is a kind of project in which it's possible to believe that as a project that we create from scratch so that's why ultimately i think what we need is not a centrist program which can be invoked by a party that restores that tries to restore trust in a broken system but a political movement that enables us to channel the critique of the system in the right way, and which makes these great policy ideas that you all give in your books, not part of a defense of the status quo, but the basis for thinking the foundations of our society from scratch. And I think I'll just leave it at that. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Leia. So um, I have hands up and uh, Eric and Martin are chomping at the bit to, 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 to reply. I'm also um, aware that we only have around half an hour left and there are questions piling up in the Q&A feed. Um, and I also wanted to say something about what Leah just said. So we have, a, um, we have conflict and conflict uh, over resource, scarce resources here. Uh, so what I will probably do, I could just um, say a word myself, then uh, hand very briefly over to Eric and Martin for a quick reply, and then we'll go straight to Q&A. What I wanted to say about, I mean, I, I, I share a lot of Leia's critique, but one thing uh, I think that needs to be added is that our idea of the post-war, the 30 glorieuse, the post-war uh, democratic capitalism that seemed to work so well until the 70s, I think we tend to look back at it as a period of political stability in which there was kind of broad agreement in Britain. We talk about butskalism, where supposedly the Labour Party and Conservative Party were converging on economic policies that were broadly inclusive and so on in many other countries have the same kind of memory i think but at the same time if you actually go and look at that history it was deeply conflictual and it was emerging out of conflict initially military conflict but also labor conflict social conflict and if you look at the history of political science a lot of the literature in the 50s and 60s is about trying to understand how political systems can hold together against the inevitable strains of you know, social conflict, which is seen as a constant. So I think sometimes you know, um, we, we need to remember that democracy, when it actually works as democracy, is always conflictual. Uh, and you know, I might diverge a bit from layer in the sense of how much we need to reinvent. Um, and I might be just satisfied with going back to the times when we could argue between communists and fascists and Christian Democrats and liberals and socialists 
uh, and all of these different movements were part of the um, part of the political conversation, which I think is what characterizes much of the post-war period. Um, anyway, so very quickly, Eric and Martin, could you just no more than a minute and a half, just as a quick reply to Leah, so we can get some questions in. Eric, you go first. Sure. Um, well, I don't hark back to some glorious past, and I don't aspire to occupy the center. Uh, both of those to me are, are meaningless fictions. Um, and I don't, but I don't think there's an inconsistency between capitalism and democracy. I think one of the misunderstood dimensions of free markets is as a means of conflict resolution. So it's more likely to me actually that markets are a precondition given our current state of capital, both to our, our current state of technology and social organization. I actually suspect markets are a, a precondition of democracy rather than an inconsistency. I, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic and I, but I, I'm optimistic absolutely because in a sense there is political unrest. And I, I, I ultimately think the sense of frustration is that there is a huge consensus over our moral challenges. And they are three specific issues, which I, and, and the reply to which, which we put forward in the book is just as valid, if not accelerated by the crisis. The three issues that people are motivated by politically and care considerably about are the environment, wealth inequality, to some extent income inequality, depending where you are, and the pain and suffering that's caused by recessions. And in a sense to, to, to lay out, I think we need to turn, and this is what Martin does to some extent, and I think you, 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 you can add some of the ideas that Mark and I have to what Martin has proposed, is you need to use markets and capitalism to address those problems, and you absolutely can. I mean, the fact that I give you a very simple proposal, which is put forward in the book, we could issue debt, 15, 20% of GDP at a zero interest rate for 20 years. We could buy a diversified basket of global assets, give it to any asset manager. Over 15 years, you can repay the debt and you've got those assets. You could give ownership to 80% of the population in that national wealth fund within six months. That is a stake, a material stake in the global capital stock. We simply, the problem is nowhere on the political spectrum at the moment, no one in the environment, if you stop somebody in the street and say, do you agree we need to make growth sustainable? Everybody says yes. Tell me the three policies that will do it within five years. I've no idea. Which politician's going to do it for you? I've no idea. That's the problem. It is absolutely a failure of the mind. It's, got, it's not a failure of markets. You can absolutely harness markets. You could supercharge to deliver you results. Um, so yeah, so to me, forget about the center, that's a, that's a pointless excess, what does that even mean? Um, forget about harking after some glorious past, humans will always be moving on to the next problem, the next failing, we are centuries away from perfection. But do we have a huge political opportunity here? Absolutely. Does it involve overthrowing free markets and capitalism? No, it doesn't. It means reinventing them to serve our ends. Thanks, Eric. Martin, you're um, 90 yeah. seconds. And I'm trying to think of how to do justice to, uh, <laughs> to, to Leah's many important points, um, but I'll sort of highlight some disagreements, I think. Um, I certainly don't want to romanticize the, the, the Trente Glorieuse. Uh, this goes to your point too, uh, Jonathan. Uh, and I think the mention of Roosevelt is, is worthwhile because the point about Roosevelt is, of course, it was it it was exclusionary and it didn't benefit everyone, but it did so because it didn't go far enough in the direction it was going for white Americans, as you pointed out. So Social Security excluded domestic workers and farm workers, right, who are disproportionately black. The uh, the new institutions for underwriting home mortgages that was set up by Roosevelt, uh, they were sub, you know confined by redlining. They by federally, by state and federal sanctioned redlining. So black people couldn't avail themselves of it. So those are just two examples of how the New Deal was a New Deal for white Americans, pretty much. Um, but that's not saying that the New Deal was a problem. It's that it didn't go far enough. Uh, and I think we, we agree on this, but I think it matters for whether you think the policy ideas and the political ideas themselves are 
the right ones to pursue. Then, of course, you get to the political problem of how do you expand it? Uh, and the same in the three post-war decades, certainly lots of exclusion, but things were moving in the direction of inclusion. And, and I think that isn't true just for majority groups. That's also true for women and for minority groups over time. So, of course, not ideal, but the right direction. And uh, if those things hadn't been reversed around 1980, we would have been in a better place. Um, now, in, in terms of the, the link between democracy and, and policy, democracy takes precedence. Uh, and I'm not offering a reform of democracy. I'm offering a program, among others, that I think should be on the menu in a democracy. And, and I think I'm more, I don't know if it's optimistic or pessimistic, than, uh, than certainly Leah uh, in thinking that on the whole, I think democratic dysfunction is not the problem. People have largely been getting what they voted for, or at least who they voted for. It's just that who they voted for gave them some pretty bad policies. That's not all that's going on. Much of what's underlying this is change in the economic structure that has very little to do with policy. It's rather that policy have either reacted or failed to react to this. So what worked in the post-war decades was, first of all, because where Western economies were at that stage of development, sort of largely industrial or industrial leading, um, the, the industry, manufacturing leading the economy, happened to be quite good for in itself drawing more people into high productivity jobs and facilitate the sort of politics, including collective bargaining, for example, that was easier to do in a late industrial economy than it is today. So, so in a sense, the politics kind of piggybacked a bit on the, uh, on the economy. And with the economic changes I've described from the 80s on, the old policies didn't work, the old institutions wouldn't work anymore. That's one reason why I certainly, I want to be very clear, it's not about going back to what we had. One reason why not just, you know, neoliberal oligarchs, but electorates, shifted in the 80s. And we should remember this. People voted for these policy changes. Um, it's because the old ones were rightly perceived as not working, given the underlying changes in the economy. Um, so I think, I think what, what we want is to kind of rethink what worked and find the new ways in which we can make them work, given what the, the, what the economy looks like today. Uh, Leo, you asked what proportion of my proposals would I still uphold in the current crisis? And the answer is all of them, and I would double down on them. One thing I didn't mention earlier, but, but, but we all know that the people who have been at the harsh end of the developments we have talked about have also been hit disproportionately badly by the economic consequences of the pandemic, and, and to some extent by the pandemic itself. But we're talking about the economy here. So the problems that already existed as of February have become much more acute and I'd like to hope that awareness of them has risen. Last point, uh, how do you reconcile, I think, I'm, I'm rephrasing you, Leah, but how do we reconcile my sort of idealized centrism? and I'm, I'm proud of kind of staking the center as my position, the liberal center, with actually existing centrism? Uh, well, current centrism is very much in flux. Uh, certainly rhetorically and to some extent in policy, you mentioned Rishi Sunak's uh, policies, but look at the, the moves in the Conservative Party here before the pandemic. The, the March budget was the least conservative, fiscally speaking, budget of a Conservative Chancellor in, in a generation. The whole rhetoric of levelling up is to some extent the sort of thing I'm talking about. For now, it's all rhetoric. We'll see. Although the budget did actually put much more money in than any conservative chancellor would have done in ages. Uh, and you see, you know, you could read Emmanuel Macron a bit the same way. It's an attempt to try to occupy a sort of bigger change space, but in the center, a la Roosevelt, and accepting all the flaws of, of Roosevelt's program. Um, so, so I think it's very much in flux. And I think there is a space uh, as centrists have realized they're being outcompeted by the angry parties, as I've started to call them after reading or listening to Eric, uh, because they see that, you know, the Trumps and the Le Pens and so on, they are offering radical change. They realize that there is an appetite for radical change in the electorate. That appetite will have grown because of the pandemic. We've had some radical change already. Disruption has happened. So, you know, 
you, there's no reason that that reason for being timid has disappeared. Um, the fact that you cause disruption with a big change. So I think there's a temptation, and you can sort of see this in individual politicians, a temptation to become more radical. Uh, just final sentence, uh, trust. Yes, you need trust. I did say that I don't think it's the democratic electoral system itself that needs fixing. It does in some places, unfortunately, but you, know, you still get politicians responding to voters. Um, but I think you get trust in people when the system, they feel that the system is working for them. And part of that is economic. And that's sort of what I try to address in at least two ways. One is you need to see that the system works for you. You need to belong, right? But also at the very primal level, uh, you need to be in a space where you have the economic security individually to be able to be an agent. And if you're in a very unpredictable law, job, living hand to mouth, that is it's very hard to have agency, even at a sort of micro individual level. So uh, I respectfully disagree. I think this is more constructive than, uh, than the criticism will have it, but let's have the discussion. Let disagreement okay, rip. Um, so I, um, we haven't got so much time left and we have a, um, an audience of around 300 people from all over the world who, uh, who have listed a bunch of questions for us. So what I'm gonna do now is um, I think you all have access to the Q&A feed too, so you can read, read these questions to there. So I'd just like to invite you all to comment on, I'm just going to pick a few out. So we have from Naomi Waltham-Smith, who's an associate professor at Warwick, uh, one of the more local uh, participants. Um, as a question directed at Eric, I, get, I guess, who is the arbiter of what constitutes righteous anger uh, versus tribal anger? In other words, who are the angels and who are the devils? Uh, that's a great question. Um, we have uh, an incoming LSE PhD student, Jack Bazu Melish, uh, has a question which actually speaks a little bit to what um, Martin was just talking about. Um, to what extent, really, the populist right wing anti system type movements, Trump, Orban, uh, Bolsonaro, were they really different from the historic right of people like George Wallace or, or other? you know, more mainstream right-wing politicians, I guess, in the past. Are, are these leaders actually doing the same type of politics we've often seen the sort of authoritarian conservative right produce? Um, and are they reflecting the same kind of social base of wealthy older asset holders and socially conservative people from rural areas? Uh, which, that's a really good question. Um, ben Arcus has a question uh, as an incoming philosophy student at LSE. Um, about UBI, universal basic income, which is mentioned certainly prominently in, in Martin's book, you know, will that make people happier? Will it make you happier to know that you don't have to get up in the morning and go to work, you will still have an income? Loading the question a bit there. Um, also, um, I'm just going to put in one more. Um, uh, we have a uh, Luanga Junior Kasanga, prospective student from Congo stroke Bahrain. Um, who has a question directly at Martin, do you believe that further investment in education and the easing of uh, job movement from poor go jobs to good jobs is going to be enough to alleviate um, widespread anger? So can we have, you know, um, pick and choose your, your reactions uh, and please give us some quick responses so we can get some more questions in. Maybe Eric, you could go first. You have a question directly pitched at you. Sure, and it is, it's a great question. So just to, to, to recap is the idea that how do you arbiter between the, who's the arbiter between the anger of angels and the anger of, anger of devils? I, I wanted, this is a really important point. What I'm saying is they're qualitatively different. And what I mean by that is that the Extinction Rebellion protester doesn't have to be right in the sense of correct but it's very clear the claim that they're raising, which is an ethical claim, they provide you with coherent reasons. You may disagree with them about a carbon emission target, but you know the types of reasons they will give. Now, if you go to a football match and you watch tribes at war, they don't provide you with reasons, or the reason they give you is really, really simple. Uh, I've seen this. I saw a hardcore fan who had taken his six-year-old daughter on his shoulders to watch a football game, trying to explain the football match to his, to his little daughter. And he gave up with the rules and he said, we're yellow. <laughs> she got that and she started to cheer for yellow. That is a very, very different phenomenon. 
It's exactly, and you see it present here, our propensity to want to group identify is extraordinary. It's separate to an ethical dispute. An ethical dispute is a discussion about the interests of the people affected by an action, right? That is a very clear phenomenon. Labeling something centrist, liberal, that stuff has no content. That is just group identification, which is a reflex, which is even evident in our debate. It would serve us all well to drop all of those labels and keep the matter substantive. Martin? Yeah, um, I was just looking through all the questions. There are a couple around the same theme that I'd like to address uh, sort of very quickly. And there was one question about whether greater investments in education will help shift people from, from poor jobs to good jobs. There was another question about why productivity is the measure of whether a job is good. And then there was a UBI question, which I'd like to link into this. Uh, I mean, education and, and skills, they're a necessary but not a sufficient condition. And that's true of a lot of these uh, ideas I present, probably Eric's too, he would admit, I'm sure. Uh, what that leads me to think is that actually you have a better chance of success if you try and do a lot at the same time. And this is another argument, a kind of practical argument for radicalism. Uh, partly it's that the economic effects of one policy, you know, if you have more education but you don't have the jobs, you, it's kind of, uh, self-defeating uh, is also politically counterproductive uh, because if you have sort of one policy change, it's much easier for those who don't want it to happen. And this goes to Leia's political questions to, uh, to mobilize, to defeat it. Whereas you kind of want to, to kind of attack the forces of the status quo on all fronts, as it were. Um, productivity, you know, I, I don't mean to say that this is a sign of a good job in, in a sort of moral sense, but, but the reason why it goes with, in a more pragmatic sense, a good job is because productive jobs allow for higher wages. You can pay somebody more if the thing they do generates more economic value. That's why a country that employs fewer of its people washing cars by hand and manages to employ them in other more useful things, a country that embraces technological change and automates more and gets rid of, you know, these, these jobs that really we could have machines doing, typically do pay higher wages. And it goes the other way around. If you have to pay higher wages, you're not going to employ somebody doing a very unproductive job. Um, you know, whether you get moral worth, moral satisfaction from a job, that's another thing. But I think you do it more, you're more likely to do it if it's a job you see that you make a good contribution in than a job that you accept because you have no other choice. And if you don't take it, you'll starve. And that brings us to the UBI idea. Um, universal basic income. I mean, the answer is that the evidence from trials is that you do become happier if you know that you don't have to go to work. Uh, and that's kind of obvious. Why wouldn't you be? Uh, the question is, does it make people less likely to work? The evidence seems to be no. Uh, does it reduce poverty better than other, uh, other benefit systems? It may not be because it's not targeted in the same way. But for me, universal basic income, um, its point, the point of it is really to empower individuals. And in particular, in uh, economies where there isn't, you know, we, you've lost an, inst an institutional framework for collective bargaining where union aren't, unions aren't strong. It's a substitute, if you like. It's basically something that allows you to say no which is one element of agency, allowing, it allows you to refuse unacceptable conditions. I find that to be a, a hugely important value and that by itself is a reason to consider uh, UBI very significantly. Maybe I'll stop there so you can take some more questions. Great, thanks. Uh, um, Leah, I don't know if you want to respond to any of those that have come up so far, but there are some specifically directed at you. Um, well, whatever you think. I mean, I, one, one thing that would be interesting to discuss more, and I would also like to hear more what Eric thinks on this, actually, on the UBI, is that I was wondering when I read Eric's book whether UBI would have a similar effect to what full employment has in the kind of Kaletsky argument that says that at some point the rich will start pushing to make more profits because, um, I mean, the, the things that Eric mentions in his uh, rendition of, of Kaletsky's uh, argument. I was wondering whether something equivalent to that critique 
would actually apply if you were to go for universal basic income and whether that would be one of the sort of sources of criticism of the policy when it comes to productivity. But I'm not an expert on that. It just occurred to me when I read the Kalecki stuff that it might have interesting implications for UBI as well. The other thing, though, is that I think there are also concerns about inequalities and hierarchies of dignity and status, which I am not sure how well the UBI would respond to unless it was set at very high levels. And so, I mean, I'm not a skeptic on this. I'm sympathetic to universal basic income issues, but I just, uh, yeah, I was just interested in hearing more what people think about that. Um, there were also a couple of other questions um, directed at you, Leah, about the possibilities of in improving democracy. Um, one from Vincent Harting, one of our own PhD students, I guess you're very familiar with him. Um, um, what kind of proposals do you imagine for democratizing our social world beyond, beyond liberal democracy? Uh, there was also a question from Jeffrey Thomas. Can you have us, and this is kind of gets to the crux of the disagreement between you and, and, and I guess Martin and, and probably Eric too. Can you have a centrist system with greater participatory activity via things like people's assemblies, reinvigoration of local governments and so on? Okay, great. So, I mean, I think there is a sense in which talking about centrism in general doesn't mean much because we don't know where the center is unless we know where the poles are and so where the you know what the parameters of the discourse are and so i think this is why i think of course some of the centrist proposals could be considered extremely radical and in fact i think are considered extremely radical by people who are i don't know i was reading today the adam smith institute for example and what they think about negative rates and so on so one one of the concerns that i have and this is why i say why don't you just call it anti-system radicalism rather than centrism is that it seems to be that centrism gives the idea that there is some continuity with the status quo when in fact the set of policies policies is so radical and would generate such political upheaval and conflict that I think those who propose those policies would be better off just promoting them as the radical policies that they are to go with a kind of radical politics. So this is where it's partly a discussion, a question of, of rhetoric and, and policies of rhetoric. When with the question about how do you improve democracy and possibilities of improving democracy, this is in part, I think also goes to some of the questions that um, Eric was raising at the beginning about free markets as a means of conflict resolution. I think if you want to reform democracy, the first thing, and if you take democracy seriously, and political democracy seriously, the first thing you need to do is to remove the impact of money on politics. If you have hierarchies of sure. wealth yeah. that condition political debate, then I don't think you have effective democracy. So the question is, what can you do to eliminate the impact of money in politics such that you can still have people who are really rich, which is where also where some of my skepticism, the kind of systemic skepticism comes from with liberalism is how can a system like that be compatible with capitalism? How can you actually eliminate the impact of money on politics, but also on public on information, on the public sphere, on the circulation, on the media, and so on? It seems to me that the reason why a lot of the political debates we have and the reason that the poor or the people who are suffering from current inequalities are disenfranchised is that they don't have sufficient political power because they don't have the conditions, the material conditions under which they would have equal political power. So it's true that I think to some extent the party system responds to the grievances of the poor, but it doesn't respond equally to the grievances of the poor and to the grievances of the rich because of the way in which wealth influences both politics, but also information and so access to information. So once you eliminate these two things, I don't know how what you are left with is actually still a capitalist system, but you know I would be happy with whatever you're left with. Can I pick up on that? Um, uh, you know this label of centrism. Um, I do want continuity. I mean that's why I'm. So I agree. Centrism does does imply that, and and that's part of what I want. I want to maintain economic openness. I want it to continue or to be to to return to it being easy to move from one country to another, to invest in another country, to trade across borders. I want to preserve that. I want to preserve capitalism. In fact, I think part of the problem we have is that capitalism has been sort of perverted, become less capitalist. Uh, so let me give you a couple of examples. Um, and I think this also goes to the political strategy question. You know, How do you convince the rich to simplify, to support this sort of thing? Uh, here's a sort of quiz question. Which country has a higher proportion of multimillionaires per capita, the USA or Norway? The answer is Norway. Uh, 
here's another way of thinking about it. Um, if you hadn't had the misguided turn to excessive fiscal consolidation in Europe after the global financial crisis, the UK, but also other European countries, if you hadn't had austerity, there's a good chance that the economies would today be quite a bit larger, 10, 15, 20% larger than they are. I mean, do we really think that that would have been worse for the richest? They would have been better off too. But the point I'm trying to make here is that a uh, what I call an economy of belonging uh, is actually better even for the rich. Uh, but there's a there's a bit of false, false consciousness going on uh, among the very wealthy class. And uh, again, I go back to my only weapon is ideas. So that's what I wield. Uh, I think what we can do is to try to expose some of those uh, misconceptions, essentially. Can I just, yeah. my sense when I listen to, to Leia is that, and, and this for me is the challenge. See, to me, the failing is one of ideas. Um, you know, I, I think we, we make progress through, through ideas, you know, so take, take an example, if we think of you know, sustainable, the environmental challenge, where I think there's an overwhelming consensus there's a hugely powerful latent political movement, but it's, it completely lacks expression because of a failure of ideas, right? So if, I, so if I think, so for example, it takes you less than three years to build wind energy and the, the state has a zero cost of debt. Why aren't we trying to target 90% alternative energy in the UK in the next five years? You could solve lots of Martin's challenges. You'd increase manufacturing, you'd provide better jobs, you'd do regional economic development. I haven't heard a single politician stand up on a platform and make that case. I've barely heard an intellectual make that case. You know, so, I'm, I'm, so this, to me, it's profoundly important. I, I, I look at monetary policy as well, and I look at, we're running central banks the way they were set up in the 1800s. And yet they've gone, they used to be responsible for fiscal policy and providing liquidity to banks. Now they're responsible for saving the economy in a recession, and they're still using an interest rate. This is a huge failure of the mind. And I think you can smash through political identities, associations, and allegiances with the blindingly obvious. But I mean, this happens all the time with human beings. Something that sounds an impossible idea, somebody does it and it works, and then everybody does it and, and you're stupid for not doing it. Look at quantitative easing. You know, People would have thought you were barking mad 15 years ago if you proposed it. Frankly, I think it is a very silly idea, but that's beside the point. It's off the scale radical, left, right, or center, wherever you want to position it on a two-dimensional view of the world. It's a third dimension, and yet it's now accepted that everybody does it. There's a huge intellectual failure. And what the policies that are interesting are, the, are very simple. They make a difference to your life, and they address inequality, they address the environment, and they address recessions. We have had no big ideas to address any of those in the last 15 years. No wonder it's being hijacked by tribalists. But Eric, at the same time, uh, your books are full of such ideas. And in fact, if there's anything that's been frustrating about this last decade is, is not that we've been stuck in a crisis we don't know how to get out of, but that we've been stuck into, in a crisis that we know how to get out of and that we can't we're not, we've not been able to mobilize politically the, the, the collective power to be able to put those ideas in practice. I, I think your books actually show that we do have these ideas and there are, um, and there are very vibrant intellectual communities. And now due, with social media, we can all talk to each other all of the time. We are not lacking ideas. What we are lacking is organization. And I think a lot of that comes back to the points that Leah was making about money in politics and the way in which deep inequalities prevent our democracy from working as democracy. And it may be um, against the interests of the wealthy to refuse to contemplate these changes, but the wealthy can get things wrong just the way ordinary voters can too. But in the post-war period, if that is, you know, our possible model, at least it happened, um, part of the reason it happened was because the wealthy were cowed into accepting things that before the war they had not accepted and because of the fear of a repetition of the conflict or because of the fear of communism or, or, or because of the organized power of the working people. Um, they, they were effectively bullied into accepting some of those ideas. There's a long-standing debate in political science about how much they wanted these things themselves and how much they were forced into it. But either way, 
you know, democratic power was at the heart of it. So I'm going to abuse my power as chair to uh, have taken the final word here. Um, thanks very much uh, to our panelists, Eric Lonigan, Martin Sambu, Leah Ippi, for a fantastic discussion. And thank you also to the over 300 participants uh, on this webinar. And I'm only, and we had around 40 odd questions, which I was only able to take a very small sample of them. But thank you so much for listening in and taking part in the conversation. And I hope you all enjoyed it. Just final reminder, there should be a podcast published published uh, in the next week or so. You should be able to see the link to that in the event listing page. And finally, just don't forget to check in with pages of Hackney and look at our books that are on sale and can be ordered online and delivered um, through our COVID resistant workforce that is keeping us all going these days. Um, so that that's it. Thanks to, for listening. And um, Thanks, and I look forward to talking. Thanks again. very much. That was great.